The Codex Gigas, also known as the Devil's Bible, due to the large illustration of the devil on the inside of the giant book, it is also connected to the legend surrounding its creation. It is largely thought to have been created in the early 12th century in the Benedictine monastery of Bodlegisa in Bohemia. According to legend, the Codex was created by a character known as Hermann the Recluse in the Benedictine monastery near Chirdim in the Czech Republic. The monastery was destroyed sometime in the 15th century during the Hussite Revolution. The Codex was thankfully rescued and taken to the Benedictine monastery in Brzezivnov. From 1477 to 1593, it was kept in the library of a monastery until it was taken to Prague in 1594 to form part of the collections of the Empire Rudolf II. In 1648, it was taken as war booty by the Swedish army. In 1697, it would escape destruction again when a fierce fire broke out at the royal castle in Stockholm, subsequently destroying the royal library. The codex was rescued from the flames by being thrown from a window. According to the vicar, Johann Eriksons, the codex landed on a bystander, injuring him quite badly. In September 2007, after 359 years of changing hands in numerous ways, the Codex Gigas was returned to the National Library in Stockholm. But what makes the Codex particularly special and worthy of further investigation are the characteristics within the writings of this enormous book, which astonishingly support the story of it being created in just one sitting. A National Geographic documentary included interviews with manuscript experts who argued that certain evidence, in particular the handwriting analysis and the long-standing credit to Herman Inclusus, aka Herman the Recluse, indicate the manuscript was indeed, somehow, the work of just one scribe. According to the historical legend, which was already academically recorded by the Middle Age, the scribe was a monk who broke his monastic vows and was sentenced to be walled up alive. In order to avoid this harsh penalty, he promised to create, in one night, a book to glorify the monastery forever. This book would include all human knowledge. Near midnight, he became sure that he could not complete this task alone, so he made a special prayer, not addressed to God, but to the fallen angel Lucifer, asking him to help finish the book in exchange for the monk's soul. The devil would accept this deal, completing the rest of the manuscript the monk would add the devil's picture out of gratitude for his help. Many specialists within the area of writing, forensic analysis, and also numerous replication attempts have indicated that the level of uniformity within the writings lean towards the impossible. Not only does it strongly indicate that the book was created in just one sitting, but is perfectly scribed throughout, a feat considered to be beyond that of human capabilities. The analysis also shown that the writings alone, if written by one person, would take over five years to complete, with the additional illustrations adding another 20. Yet it must be noted, it has been concluded on many occasions that no mere mortal is capable of such uniform writings within this time period. There would have inevitably been some form of evolution within the style. Of course, it must be remembered Although there is a highly compelling story attached to the origins of this giant book, its creation still largely remains a mystery. How big would you have to be for it to comfortably rest in one's lap? What sort of person, if of course it was a person, could have written the Codex Gigas? And how did they write it? It is most certainly one of the world's most mysterious books. Edinburgh, Scotland a very ancient land with a castle built upon an extinct volcano. Many mysterious things lay and possibly live within Scotland, the most famous of which undoubtedly the extremely elusive Loch Ness Monster. However, recent surveys would suggest that among the most popular of attractions are in fact its vast collection of, to the well-trained eye, extremely ancient coves and cave systems. Hand cut. These caverns will demonstrate the immense skill, determination, and of course ingenuity of our distant ancestors, revealing to all those who are lucky enough to visit them just what these ancient people were capable of. And hidden behind a modest door on Drum Street in Gilmerton 
is quite possibly the most incredible network of them all. Underground passageways, large, perfectly carved chambers, benches, tables, and even a small chapel, all painstakingly hewn from solid stone by hand. And thankfully, due to their popular attraction with tourists, often the explorers amongst us, many open-minded individuals, have often been left with a sense of discomposure regarding the officially upheld explanation for their origins. As such, and rather predictably, many alternative theories, often involving a far more ancient origin for the cove and its purpose, now abound. The mass-regurgitated view regarding the construction would suggest that a blacksmith by the name of George Patterson, who actually resided within the cove within the 18th century, somehow created them alone, by hand, and within a mere five-year period, with even George himself claiming to have cut this extensive, elaborate, and unquestionably enigmatic underground structure using simple hand tools. Since the claims three centuries ago, however, numerous holes have been seemingly discovered within this popularly upheld sequence of events, fueling the already prevalent suspicions within skeptic parties maybe in an attempt to hide its true antiquity, as we experience so often during our research. On Wednesday, the 15th of August, 1906, a front-page column by a writer known as F. R. Coles for The Scotsman dug into George Patterson's version of events, commonly referred to as the tradition. Coles found it to have been nothing but a fictional fallacy, possibly created by George himself in an attempt to profit from deception. It seems Patterson not only accomplished the seemingly impossible, excavating hundreds of tons of stone, but also it seems he successfully went unnoticed by the entire surrounding population during this entire procedure. Just who could have built Gilmerton Cove? When was it built? Why did they build it? With modern radar scans of the surrounding area indicating that even more systems lay close by, still undiscovered, possibly isolated by ancient cave-ins, you have to wonder, could the Gilmerton Cove be far older and originally far grander and extensively larger than anyone today could have ever possibly imagined? Will we ever solve the mystery of Gilmerton Cove? It seems only time will tell. There are countless ancient uparts, which can be found littering ancient antiquities and indeed, the exhibits which are so often attributed to an ancient civilization subsequently debunked by said studies, as having been capable of such ancient developments. As such, these artifacts are known as out-of-place artifacts or uparts, as they have become affectionately known. One such artifact is that of the Wedge of Ayud, a large, clearly machined piece of metal made of high-purity aluminium dated by many researchers as that of an ancient artifact. The problem is, aluminium in this density was not developed by modern man until the late 19th century, around 1825 to be precise. Weighing an impressive 5 pounds in weight, the wedge was originally dug up, found deep within the sediments of a riverbank in modern-day Romania, disregarded by many as that of a modern-day JCB tooth. There are just as many, however, who argue, and we feel for good reason as we shall reveal, that this artifact is indeed ancient and has, through the years, continued to raise difficult questions to answer. Ancient alien enthusiasts insist that the wedge is a segment of an ancient alien craft, or more specifically, a VTOL type craft, better known as a vertical takeoff and landing craft and the large visible signs of aging are supportive of not only a tremendous age, but of its currently unexplainable origins here on Earth. It was found during digging on a construction project, along with two mastodon bones in 35 feet of sand. Someone gave it to the Museum of History of Transylvania, where it lay ignored in a storeroom for 20 years before editors from a Romanian UFO magazine found it in 1995. Furthermore, although some skeptics attempt to argue that the wedge is of modern origins, it was found in the same layer as that of the mastodon bones, 
with a wedge accepted by a large number of others as being at least 11,000 years old. This dating makes this a very peculiar item indeed, and something which we feel demands further examination. If the wedge is indeed around 11,000 years old, as the evidence, witness testimony, and dating of the sediments it was found within would suggest, then the question of how such a lump of almost pure, clearly machined aluminium originated from, and indeed what was the original purpose of the wedge. Was it like the ancient alien enthusiasts insist once part of a vertical takeoff and landing craft? Or maybe from something else? Questions still circle the wedge's true origins, and without solid evidence to prove the wedge's modern origins, we must stick to the evidence already acquired that of the wedge's original resting place, the dating of said sediments, and the lack of any contradictory evidence in regards to works being done in this area at this depth along the riverbank within Romania. We must entertain the idea that this five-pound, almost pure metallic object is indeed that of an ancient upart, and any other explanation lacking evidence is just an attempt to disregard such claims as they do not jive with modern paradigm, an occurrence we witness all too often. What is the Wedge of Ayud? How old is it? Could it indeed be 11,000 years old? And if so, how was it manufactured and machined, and what could it have been possibly used for? It is an object which we find highly compelling. In our last video, we explored the astonishing discovery recently made upon the Giza Plateau, hidden in plain sight, another great sphinx. However, this doppelganger of the better-known, long-claimed sole guardian of the Great Pyramids seemingly possesses a greater level of undiluted erosion, indicative of both sculptures' tremendous age. The questions are, however, just how great is their age? How long have the Sphinx, or indeed the Great Pyramids, been here on our planet? Furthermore, the tremendous levels of erosion seen on the pyramids themselves. Not only do the pyramids display a level of erosion indicative of a prehistoric timeline, but they have seen many additional efforts by a number of now lost civilizations, each far more capable in regards to stonework than the modern man created a number of layers of far less eroded casing stones, each displaying a varying age, this evidence indicative of several attempts at conservation. These factors all but support the following posit, made by a number of researchers, all claiming that the Sphinx, and indeed we feel, the pyramids themselves, are in actuality as much as 800,000 years old. The most recent studies were surprisingly presented at the International Conference of Geoarchaeology and Archaeomineralogy held in Sofia. Titled Geological Aspect of the Problem of Dating the Great Egyptian Sphinx Construction, the authors of this paper, mainstream scientist Monica Vacheslav from the Institute of Environmental Geochemistry of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, and Alexander G. Parkomenko. Institute of Geography of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine have blown the whistle regarding what we have supported for a number of years. The starting point of these two experts is the paradigm shift, which has been initiated within the quote debate, which has been intended to overcome the orthodoxy within Egyptology, referring to the possible remote origins of the Egyptian civilization, and, on the other, physical evidence of water erosion present at the monuments of the Giza Plateau, which, although suspiciously mainstream researchers such as West and Scotch have made over the years, specifically titles the water erosion controversy, which deliberately overlooked that the Sphinx, having once been recorded as having been surrounded by a body of water, namely Anubis Lake, meaning that the enclosure was once designed with the intent of holding water itself in turn concealing the Sphinx's possible true identity. Instead, focuses on the erosion clearly made by rainfall and ancient water levels, features we indeed claim were later additions. 
according to Manichev and Parkomenko, quote, The problem of dating the Great Pyramid Sphinx construction is still valid despite the long-term history of its research. Geological approaches and other scientific methods permits us to answer the question about the relative age of the Sphinx. The conducted visual investigation of the Sphinx allowed the conclusion regarding the important role of water from large bodies which partially flooded the monument, with the formation of wave-cut hollows on its vertical walls. The morphology of these formations has an analogy with similar such hollows, formed by the sea in the coastal zones. Genetic resemblance of the compared erosion forms and the geological structure and petrographic composition of sedimentary rock complexes leads to the conclusion of the existence of long-lived freshwater lakes within various periods of the lower Pleistocene era. These lakes were distributed in the territories adjacent to the Nile. The absolute mark of the upper large erosion hollow of the Sphinx corresponds to the level of water surface which took place in this early Pleistocene age." End quote. A link to the research can be found in the script. It is a vindicating exposure of ours and others' work, one which we find highly compelling. Archaeologists have discovered yet another ancient anomaly, which has linked a now lost but once clearly advanced global civilization. Pertaining to a wall relief in Peru, belonging to the oldest civilization in the Americas. The wall, although dated to approximately 3,800 years ago, depicts what many now believe is an illustrated narrative of the difficulties they experienced prior to a cataclysm caused by an ancient climate change. One meter high and 2.8 meters long, the wall relief was discovered in the seaside archaeological site of Vichama, 110 kilometers north of Peru's capital, Lima. The Vichama site is part of the recently discovered, yet now lost, Caral civilization, also known as Norte Chico. Dated at over 5,000 years ago, this dating alone makes it the oldest civilization known to have dwelled within the Americas, now claimed as purely coincidental. This civilization flourished around the same time as that of the thriving civilization of Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, and also Chinese civilizations. The Corral civilization was located in the Supi Valley, along the north-central coast of Peru. Made of adobe, a clay-like material, the wall seemingly documents climate change, one which could not have been contributed to by human activities. Archaeologist Ruth Shandy, who oversaw the excavations at the site, hypothesized that the serpents within represented a water deity that irrigated the earth and made seeds grow. She believes the relief was likely done towards the end of a drought and famine, that the Corral civilization, among others we have covered in the past, once experienced with other reliefs displaying emaciated humans. Many self-funded archaeologists now believe, like we have postulated, that the discovery reinforces the notion that these early humans were depicting the difficulties they faced due to climate change and a depletion in available water for irrigation, which had a large impact on their agricultural production. The excavation has, to date, unearthed the ruins of 22 buildings in a 25-square-hectare space. It would appear that, just like that of the site of Tikal and the now-lost plaque which once depicted the dramatic scene of a cataclysm, a great flood, along with erupting volcanoes, with a boat seemingly attempting to escape this event, surrounded by many of the population drowning, a cooperating artifact fortunately photographed before its mysterious disappearance. Was there indeed a great flood? One which seemingly followed a great famine? It would seem the evidence for such an event is mounting, thanks to not only the evidential sediments which once drenched many of the still unexplained ancient sites of the world, but also by its depiction by those who lived through it. It is, indeed, a highly compelling mystery.